Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this morning. You have so many good things uh, for your people. And I thank you, Lord, that uh, we can call upon you. We're not ashamed of you. We're not ashamed of the gospel. We're not ashamed of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're not ashamed of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We're not ashamed of anything that you want to do, Lord. And I, and I thank you, Father. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that, uh, that you want to do great and mighty things that we know not. And, and we're not afraid to ask you for big things because you're a big God. We don't want to limit you. We want to believe you for the best that you have to give. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And I want you to know that uh, I had this, I kept seeing the numbers 1111 this week. And, and I'm, I'm not like all freaky about the numbers thing where I'm looking for numbers and trying to interpret numbers all the time. But I, I, I kind of am sensitive to when God's trying to speak to me through different means and uh, uh, trying to get my attention about something. And uh, I kept seeing the numbers 1111. And I, I, didn't, I didn't really know what that meant. And I have these books that have numbers and their meanings in the Bible and all this stuff. But even though you have books that tell you what the numbers mean from the Bible, and all that, you still have to, the Holy Spirit's still trying to say something to you personally, and you still have to hear from Him personally. So, uh, the whole, I felt like the Holy Spirit told me to look up um, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 11. And I thought, okay, you know, let's give it a shot, 11, 11. Look up Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 11. And it says, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength. By faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. So her faith caused her to, to, to have the strength to do the impossible and to get over those roadblocks, praise the Lord. You know, <laughs> the faith and the promise of God gave her strength. You know, uh, sometimes, you know, people don't realize that you're a person of faith. You're a person that trusts the Lord, that believes in the Lord. Your faith is not a weakness. Your faith and trust in the Lord is a source of great strength. Because, because I, I mean, I, I, I would not have been able to get through so many things in life if it wasn't for my faith in the Lord. It wasn't for my trust in the Lord. And, and uh, some of us are real radical and the, the reason why we're radical is not because we're more spiritual, it's because we're more needy than the rest of us, and we need, the, we need God. I mean, I, I mean, one of the things a person has to do is admit that they have a need. You know, I, I mean, I have a need. I have a huge need. And uh, so I, I know that you do too. And so I'm not afraid to rely on God and to pray to God and to have faith and to get the strength that comes from Him. Now in Ephesians 3, 14 through 16, it says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He may grant you according to the riches of His glory, and riches of His glory, His unlimited supply. Riches of glory, His unlimited supply, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man in the inner man. So, well, well I, I, don't, I need strength in my body. I need strength in my mind, you know. The inner man, the, the heart is so important. Have, you know, the heart, having heart, having strength and, and staying power and continuing in something. Uh, it says, it says uh, uh, a man's spirit will sustain him in, in his weakness or infirmity. That's in the Proverbs. What is that saying? That's saying even though a man might have some weaknesses, because he's got a strong spirit, it will sustain him and carry him over the top. So it's important to have a strong spirit and to be strengthened with might in the inner man, to face life's challenges by, by strength in the inner man. There was this, these two kids that used to come to my youth group, one of my first youth groups when I was a youth pastor, and uh, uh, the older brother, he, he weighed about, oh, maybe 155 pounds, and he was, he was thin and wiry. And the younger brother started to grow bigger than he was. The younger brother was passing 200 pounds and he was like six foot one. And, uh, and he, was, he, was, he was like towering over the older brother. And the, but the older brother, every time, every time the younger brother would be out, out of hand or something, the older brother would, would make him do stuff and, and, and challenge him and stuff. And, and one time the younger brother thought, well, I'm going to use my size. I'm sick of taking orders from my older brother. So, he's, so he stood up in front of his, his little older brother and he goes, yeah, you can make me. 
And the older brother said, I just want you to know it's not the size of the dog. It's the size of the fight in the dog. <laughs> and he backed right down. He backed right down. And I, I thought, whoa. You know, isn't that true? Being strong in the inner man. Being strong in the inner man. It's not the size of the devil. It's not the bully of the devil. It's the side of Jesus in you. Greater is he in you than he that is in the world. Woo! Yeah. That was a good spot. So, uh, I just, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is, the, is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Getting our strength from him and our faith from, from him. And knowing that he is with us. Okay, let's go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30. I'm just going to walk through a little bit of this story and then make a few comments be, um, to encourage you today. And in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, uh, David was on the run from King Saul. King Saul knew that the prophecies, he found out about the prophecies that David was going to be the next king of Israel. And because of Saul's unfaithfulness, David was going to replace Saul as the king of Israel. And his, he was so jealous of the favor of God upon David that he wanted to kill him. And I just want you to know, jealousy is a nasty thing. Being jealous of other people, what other people have, and what you don't have, and what you... It's, it's not good to compare yourself with others and allow the spirit of jealousy to, to come upon you. It's, it's a very destructive thing. And uh, if you've ever... You know, I, I remember a couple times somebody was jealous of me f for some reason, and, and it shocked me. I goes, why would they be jealous of me? I don't even get it. You know, uh, but because there's other people that are so much more successful in so, in so many different ways. You, you know what I mean? That you, you go, oh, why would they even be jealous of me? I don't even care. But you know, uh, pastors have to fight jealousy too. You know, we go to be these sectional councils and there's, there's always churches that are smaller. There's always churches that are bigger. There's always people that have more influence. There's always people that have less influence. How many know that you have to, wh what you have to do is you have to s get down with the Lord and say, you know, the most successful thing is being faithful to what God has called you to do. You know, I'm not going to be judged by the same standard that Billy Graham is judged by because Billy Graham was called to something different than what I'm called to. The important thing is that you're faithful with what God's called you to do. You're faithful with the position and the job and the family and the things that God has you to do. That is success for the Lord. It's all you got to worry about is being faithful the best you can with what God has given you to do and let the promotion and everything be the Lord. Right? And, uh, and that is success, is being faithful with what the Lord has given us. So uh, he's on the run. He's, in, he, he's uh, coming back to Ziglag. Let's pick it up. Chapter 30, verse 1. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag, where they were staying with their families, on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag, attacked Ziglag and burned it with fire. I just want you to know that the Amalekites should have been a non-issue. There shouldn't have been any Amalekites. Saul was, was unfaithful. He was supposed to get rid of those Amalekites, but here they were, causing trouble. Right? And, uh, and it says, and he invaded the south. It says, and they had taken captive the women and those who were there, from small to great, and they did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there, there it was, burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. And David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. That's, that's grief right there. You know, when you're weeping so much, you don't have any more power to weep. To weep. And uh, uh, hopefully you'll never have to experience that level of grief in your life. Uh, and David's two wives, Ahinoman and uh, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal the Carmelite, had been taken captive. So here, here's a situation right here. In the Old Testament, they were allowed to have more than one wife. But even, even with more than one wife, there was many family problems. You know, there was jealousy among the wives, and there was all kind of family problems. I want you to know that when God created Adam and Eve, he didn't create Adam and Eve and Joan and, you know, Abigail, and he created <laughs> one wife for Adam. And in, in the New Testament, it says, let them be the husband of one wife. So, so in the New Testament, it kind of goes back to, it was permitted in the Old Testament, but it, it wasn't always God's best. Everybody with me? Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, some things that were permitted in the Old Testament, all of a sudden the New Testament says, no, nah, that's no good anymore. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, just want to put that little commentary in there. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of the people were grieved, but every man, every man for his sons and daughters, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. So this is, this is the importance of, of you being strong spiritually and having a strong relationship with the Lord because you can't always depend on other people to be there to encourage you. You can't always, always depend on, on uh, uh, you know, the sermon of the day on YouTube from your favorite preacher. You can't always intend, uh, to, you have to have something inside of you. You have to have some root inside of you. You have to have connection and personal relationship with the Lord yourself to get the strength from the Lord you need because who knows, it could be in a situation like David where everybody's turned against you and you're on your own and you know in the end of the day we all are on our own I mean we do have people that can rely on and that love us and that care for us but it, it's you you are the one that has to have a personal relationship with Jesus a personal relationship with God you're the one that has to stand before God by yourself your friends are not going to be with you your parents aren't going to be with you uh, your children are not going to be with you. You are going to be there alone, and it's you and the Lord facing God. Yeah. And when you make a decision for Christ, it isn't based on I was born in a Christian family or I was baptized into a certain church or denomination. It's a personal relationship that you have with God. Praise the Lord that you're developing and that you're growing in that faith. So David, he had, this is a real uh, testimony to the character of David. David had spent years of loneliness taking care of sheep and he developed a personal relationship with God without dependence on people you know and so he he went back to what he knew well I don't know how I got in this situation but let's let's find out and the thing is when there's a tragedy you can see you know after you've asked exhausted all the why questions why is this happening why you know was it because we offended God in some way were the were the Philistines you know were, was it because we allied ourselves with the Philistines was it because who, whose fault is it now let's figure out who to blame is it my husband is it my wife is it my kids is it is it the uh, pastor <laughs> <laughs> is, is it is it the president who who do we who do we blame after you've exhausted who to blame you're still faced with the problem right. right and 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 so the next question is well what do we do from here right. what are we going to do now and we should have got to that question really fat a lot faster than having to go through all the drama of wanting to stone the leader and everything right we still have to get to that well what do we do from here and so David pressed into the Lord, and, the, and, and he said to Abiathar the priest, Abimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. Now the ephod was ornate, and it had, it had in it the urim and the thummim, which is the lights and the glory, and it was a way that they sought God back in the Old Testament. We, nobody really knows what exactly those, those two articles were. It's not really described real clear, and we don't have any testimony in the Bible of how they sought God with those, with those things that were in the ephod, the, uh, the uh, lights and the glory. Unum and the thummim, they were called. We don't know if, if it was a black and white stone that said yes or no, or if one glowed when it was a certain answer. Nobody really knows. But uh, but one thing's for sure. Somehow, you know, Abiathar was the was the anointed you know priest, and he had a connection with the Lord. He was prophetic, and he was a prophet. And and when they got to get when they brought the ephod there, Abiathar brought the ephod to David, and David inquired of the Lord, saying, "Shall I pursue this truth? Shall I overtake them?" And he, God, answered him, "Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all." Now, what an amazing word. You know, go after them, and you're going to recover everything, David. Everything that you lost. I mean, there was a pastor friend of mine, and his his wife had an affair with an elder of the church, and then divorced him and left him. And the church was was really struggling because because he was in a denomination where he couldn't he couldn't be divorced and still be a pastor of the church, and uh, and. And the church was kind of split over some things, and, and it was, everything was falling apart around him. And the Lord had me go go and visit him, and I and I and I said, I said, I just want you to know. And I, I sh shared this story with him, and, and it was very prophetic. And I said, This is the word of the Lord to you: Pursue the Lord, and you shall overtake everything, and you not you'll recover everything. You'll recover everything is going to be recovered for you.
Well, w that that word wasn't a, it wasn't specific about how everything was going to be recovered. But he ended up, uh, uh, you know, remarrying with a beautiful wife, and he ended up pastoring another church in Saginaw, and he was better, better, more successful than he was before all this tragedy happened. He not, he recovered all. It, it looked a little differently than sometimes what you might have in your mind. But, but if God says you'll, there's restoration in the Lord and you'll not fail to recover all, there's going to be some kind of recovery. Job lost his children. He's not going to get those children back. They died. You know, his wife left him. You know, who knows what happened to her. She said, just curse God and die. I mean, that's the kind of woman she was. <laughs> you know, everybody needs a wife like that. <laughs> Just curse God and die, you know. So, but uh, he ended up getting, a, a, you know, twice as much as what he had before, more children. You know, he was blessed. He was doubly blessed in the end after his situation than what he did before. He not failed to recover at all. But I just want you to know that the restoration of the, the Lord is not just recovering just what you lost. Every time you see restoration in the Bible, it's always way more than what you lost. So, so it's like, uh, okay, why did the, what, what, what caused this disaster? The Amalekites caused the disaster. Evil people did something evil to people. We live in a fallen world. Bad things happen. But the, what's great is if a bad thing happens, you don't know Jesus, then just a bad thing happens. But if you, a bad thing happens to you and you know Jesus, well, then God has a plan. God has a way of victory. There's some, there's some kind of restoration that can happen, and you can overcome. You have faith in the Lord, and it brings you strength. It's random and uncalled for, and it makes no sense when you don't know Jesus. But when you know Jesus, and you go, you know... In this life, we're going to experience some storms. But I've built my house upon the rock. And even though the storms are coming and raging, I will stand. I will stand. Where the unbeliever and the sinner, storms and, rage, and, and storms come, and they will not, they'll fall, and great will be the fall of it. And they may never recover from the tragedy. They may never recover from, from those things. But you will recover. You will recover all, and then some. Okay, somebody say amen or something. <laughs> you know, praise God. Isn't that true? So, just, I'm not going to read all these scriptures, but I just want to say, there's ways to strengthen yourself. In the Lord. How do I practically strengthen myself in the Lord? In Isaiah 40, it says, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Wait for Him. Be patient. Sit quietly before the Lord. You know, don't be anxious about, we, we panic. We panic in situations. We, we go, something must be done, something must be done. No, don't panic. Calm yourself and wait on the Lord. It says, uh, it says, Psalm 27, verse 4, saying, Wait on the Lord, I say, be of good courage, and he will strengthen your hearts. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And, he, it, and that's what David did. He, instead of just rushing off, he inquired and waited on God. What does God want me to do in this situation, right? Okay, number two, prayer strengthens you in the Lord. Jude 20 says, pray in the Holy Ghost, building yourself up on your most holy faith. And uh, I would encourage you, man, if, if you don't have a prayer language, you, you, you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, I would encourage you to seek, seek the, the prayer language that God wants to give you because you can pray in tongues and, and you can pray beyond your understanding of your, of your mind. Some, sometimes we don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the Holy Spirit can help us and he can pray through us and we can pray through us in a supernatural language over the situation. And he prays the perfect will of God. Yeah, and you, it says pray in the Holy Ghost, building up your most holy faith. Amen? Uh, you know, uh, uh, worship, worship the Lord. Abraham was strengthened in his faith, worshiping the Lord. Abraham was strengthened in his faith, worshiping the Lord. I would always tell you, whenever you come to a worship service, worship by faith. Start entering in. Well, I don't know this song. Try to sing it anyways. You can learn real quick. You know, try to enter into the worship as best you can. Well, I'm not one of those hand raisers. Well, get to it. Get to it. Start raising your hand. The Bible says lift up holy hands. You know, there's every all these verses about lifting up your hands in the sanctuary. Why do we do it? Apparently, God likes it. Apparently, God likes it wants us to do it, it makes him happy. And you know, when you, start, when you start obeying God, whether you like it or not, when you just start obeying God, start raising your hands and worshiping the Lord, something miraculous happens. Strength comes into your spirit. Something miraculous happens. You feel yourself surrendering to the Lord. You start, the fear of man drops off. You don't care what people think anymore. You know, before you're like, well, I, you know, I don't want to be one of those. I, I don't, people might look at me. And then pretty soon you're like, 
Yeah! I don't care about that. I don't care what people think. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Man, if you're ashamed of Jesus in church, what do you, what do you like when you're out there at school and in the world? Come on. Come on. If you can't be a little bit free in church, you know, hey. Why should the drunks have all the fun? <laughs> and it's not too fun puking. Just want you to know. Okay, uh, it was a joke, so praise the Lord. Seeing the invisible strengthens you. Moses was strengthened seeing him who is invisible. Moses was strengthened seeing him who is invisible. <laughs> if you see the invisible, you can do the impossible. If you see the invisible God, you're strengthened. Give attention to the word. Give attention to my word. The word strengthens you. There's been times where I could literally feel physical strength coming into me when I was reading the Bible. I could literally feel nutrients and everything and energy coming into me from the Word of God. How do you explain that to people? You can't, you can't unless you experience it yourself at different times. And I believe that when you're submitting today under the anointing, because there's an anointing on me right now, and the, word, and the Lord is speaking through me, that there's strength going into your spirit just by the words that I speak to you. And uh, there, if you start looking up uh, receiving strength or strength and start doing a word search in the Bible, you'll find some amazing things. You'll find that Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and an angel came in from the presence of the Lord and strengthened him. <laughs> How did he do it? I don't know if he laid hands on him. It doesn't really say. But just from him coming from the presence of the Lord, there was emanating some kind of virtue from the angel that was strength. How, you don't know. There could be hidden angels around you at different times from the presence of the Lord that are bringing strength to you in your prayer time. Bringing strength to you. And Even now, there's angels probably sitting by you right now because there's a few empty chairs. Yes. You know? And, <laughs> and they're here. Praise the Lord. Uh, you know, so good. And, so, and Jesus came to John on the island of Patmos. And John, it, John he fell over and he was, he was, he was out. We, we, Pentecostals call it slain in the spirit. I never liked that term. He fell out in the spirit and he had no strength in him because of the presence of the Lord. And you know what? Jesus touched him and strength went right into him. Strength went. Wow, can you believe? Jesus is probably doing that. He probably comes around to you at different times and touches you and brings strength to you. Don't even realize. He's a great intercessor. He's interceding for us in the presence of the Lord. Okay, so let's, uh, let's keep going in the story and finish this up so we can all go home. And, uh, and then come back for prayer meeting tonight. So David, so, so we inquired, presume receive all. So David, verse 9, he went, he and his 600 men who were with him, and they came to the brook Bezor. I just want you to know these 600 men, these were the indebted, these were the persecuted, the, these were people, these, was, these were the losers in the kingdom, okay? The, the political enemies of King Saul and all these different people that were impoverished, and they didn't want to pay their debts and pay their bond servants, and they just escaped, and they went to David. So, so David became the leader of the losers. But something miraculously happened in their association with David. Because David had the anointing of a king upon him, which is a can-do attitude. That's what the anointing of a king is. And that's the anointing that you have. You have the anointing of a king and a priest. So you have, if, you, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, if you're saved, then you have the king's anointing on you, a can-do attitude. Not a can't, a can-do attitude. And because, because uh, uh, of that anointing on David and his can-do attitude, these men turned into mighty men. Thir Thirty of them became the mighty men of, of the kingdom, mighty warriors, you know, history makers, giant slayers. Yeah, yeah, praise the Lord. I just want you to know that your association with Jesus changes you. You are not what you were yesterday. And tomorrow you won't be the same as you are today. Because when you're around Jesus, the can-do attitude should continually be transforming you from glory to glory. Right. Praise the Lord. So, um, you know, I want to uh, skip down to this story. I want to get down to um, verse 16. 
of the story in 1 Samuel chapter 30. And when he had brought him down there, uh, there, they were, there they were spread out over the land, eating and drinking, dancing because of all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. Boy, the enemy just gloats. He's having a good time, the enemy of our souls, when he, when he brings a lot of spoil from the church. He tries to steal from the people of God. Yeah, and then uses it for unclean purposes, uses it for the world, gives it to people who are not holy. Gives it to people to use for, for terrible things. He gloats when he steals from you and me. But his gloating will not last long. It says, Then David attacked them from the twilight until the evening of the next day. So all night long he attacked them, and then all day. All night and all day. He just kept probably little pockets of fighting as they were chasing him around and just kept attacking and attacking. They never stopped attacking. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. So David recovered all that Abimelech, uh, excuse me, all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives, and nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything which had been taken from them. David recovered all. Why does it say David recovered all twice? Because it's telling you God is faithful to his promises. If he says you'll recover all, you will recover all, and it's double. It's double. Okay, praise the Lord. Don't believe me? Look at Isaiah 61, verse 7. Isaiah 61, verse 7. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. Double honor. <laughs> and instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be yours. And then, if you look up the Job scripture, he was blessed double for what was taken to him. Praise God. Double blessing. Double portion blessing. Then David took all the flocks and the herds that they had driven before those other livestock, and he said, this is David's spoil. Now David came to the 200 and that uh, did not follow him, whom they had... Okay, let's skip, let's skip that point. I, want, I, I could make a lot of points there, but I, don't want, I want to do this. So, so if you go back to verse uh, um, 26 of, of, the, of the chapter. Now when David came to Ziklag... He sent some of the spoil to the elders of Judah, to his friends, saying, Here is the present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. To those who were in Bethel, those who were in Ramoth, in the south, and those in, in Jatar. And, and it goes on to say how he, he, all these cities that he roamed in, he gave all these blessings to them, to, to them from the spoil of the Lord. And so the, the spoil that David and his army got was not just... It, it's just as much as they lost. It was far more than what they lost. Right? Praise the Lord. And then, and then uh, uh, it, when it says, this is David's spoil, was David being selfish? No. He, David knew that if, if, if he grabbed a hold of this stuff, that he could be generous and, and, and give this away and, uh, and bless the people of God. Right? He wasn't sure what they, what would the other men do? Doesn't matter. He knew that he was going to be generous with the blessings of the Lord. So let me tell you this, this truth, and, and, and uh, um, we're going to try to end here, but this is such a good truth, and it's not in the notes, but it's found in the f 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It's such an amazing thing. And it's uh, uh, verse 8 through 10, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on verse 10, but... I want, to, I want to start with verse 8. It says, now God, this is the definition of God's prosperity. Everybody say prosperity. prosperity. Now, you need to say it because sometimes people, there's such an evil connotation. People are, are, are so against anybody prospering. Did you know that in America, you're in the upper 2% of the world's wealth just living in the United States? Did, did you know that um, the United States has 75% of the world's wealth in the United States? Did you know that? Did you also know that 75% of the, of, the, of the world's painkillers are used by Americans? We have 75% of the world's wealth, but 75% of the world's painkillers we use. 
So what is it? It's not going to do you any good unless you're unless you're ble unless you're blessed of the Lord unless unless your prosperity is used for the Lord, right? I mean, you just you know how much is enough? They asked they asked John Rockefeller. They said they said, man, look at how you're the wealthiest man in the world. How much more do you need? He goes, just a little more. <laughs> it was a joke. He thought he's making a joke, but actually, it's true. It's true. I mean, how much do you need? But listen to what God's definition of prosperity, and I can guarantee you, not one of us is there yet. Not one of us is in this verse yet. Listen to this. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Do you have all sufficiency in every aspect of your life? Praise the Lord. Well, we got to do some prospering. This is the will of God. It's, there's not a dollar amount on here. It's not when you get a private jet or when you get a billion dollars. There's no dollar amount there. Right. It's whatever God's called you to do, do you have more than enough to, get, to, to help and to do good works with? <laughs> okay, but keep reading. And uh, Ed, as is written, he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now this is the truth I wanted to get you. Verse 10. Now... Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So uh, seed is not going to do anybody any good unless it's sown, unless it's planted in the ground. I mean, you can crush the seed, you can make a bread out of the wheat seed, you can make bread out of it, but, but it's not going to multiply unless it's replanted, Right? So this verse right here says, now he supplies seed to the sower. He supplies seed to the sower. God supplies seed for you to sow. God supplies seed for you to sow. If you say, I, I, my debts are too big, I have nothing to give, I have nothing to sow, you've made God a liar. You have frustrated that verse. The problem isn't that God, that, that you don't have any seed to sow. The problem is you're not, you're, not, you don't, you're not recognizing what seed God wants you to sow. You're not separating the seed that God wants you to sow. You're eating it. You're spending it. I can, I can guarantee you, if you're so indebted that you can't give, it, it isn't going to matter. You're never going to have enough. The only way to get out is to begin to, 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 to obey the word and to begin to, to sow some seed. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> are, are you raising your hand because you're praising the Lord or do you have a testimony? I have to add to the dream. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, add to that dream. Okay. <laughs> when I was doing our taxes this year, there was an amount of money that was missing from what we had said we would give over and above our tithe and the amount was seventeen hundred and seventy six dollars the amount of freedom so I said Lord I need a place to sow this seed of freedom I don't know what you're gonna give us in regards to freedom but he gave me that dream and at the end of the dream he said you are gonna be sowers of freedom you're gonna be breakers you're gonna have a breaker of anointing of freedom <laughs> so, so hold on. That that was in the dream. That seventeen seventy six. That amount. That dream came like weeks after I had sowed the seed. Oh wow! Right? And I sowed the seed into Freedom Ranch for Troy well, Brewer. Oh wow! This, I, every, everywhere I was listening, yeah, said your seed thing you were saying today. Yeah, yeah, seed. And, and I was like, Lord, I need, I need a place, and it yeah. was that Freedom Ranch. Wow. Because it was free. Yeah. Were you going to say something, Todd? Well, I was just going to say, we had thought we had given that money. We mm -hmm. did. We did. Yeah, go ahead. Is this? No, no, no. <laughs> this is going to go Talk. on the YouTube channel. <laughs> so you got to use the microphone. That was money that was designated for the Lord, but somehow it didn't get given. So we're like, the enemy tricked us. This was seed. It was supposed to be sown. It didn't get sown. I think this is a national thing, given that number. So yeah, yeah. everybody oh, yeah. needs to... Freedom. Yeah. Yeah, breakthrough freedom. Wow. You know, it's coming. It's coming. A greater anointing is coming. 
the, this is that's so cool. But my point, my point was, and I, I, I'm going a long way around the bar to make this point, is is uh, David. You know, when he won that victory, there there was seed given to him, and he recognized. He, instead of going, well, I could spend it here. I could spend it here. I could spend it here. He went, no, th this is this is something I need to sow. This is seed for sowing. Okay, I can't tell you how many times. People have, I, I said, Lord, I want to give $50 to this ministry, you know, to Joan Hunter or to, well, actually, I'll just tell you, this happened to Joan Hunter. I wanted to give $50, but my checkbook didn't have it in there. You know, and I wasn't going to write a check by faith, believing that somehow God miraculously was going to put 50 bucks in my check. Because then it would bounce and I'd look like an idiot. So, but I went, I went, Lord, you told, and God gave me the amount, $50. And then a guy came up to me and gave me a Pentecostal handshake of $50. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. This happened just last with Joan Hunter, and I and I thought to myself, all the ways I could spend that fifty dollars. <laughs> wow, I could go out to eat after church, you know. I could blah blah blah, and the Lord said, I just gave you seed. You didn't even earn that seed. I gave you the seed to sow. That's right. Yeah. I mean, and it's going to go to your credit, and and it just came to you. Okay, church, listen to me. God can give seed to the sower. God can give seed to the sower. Well, I don't have any seed. God can miraculously give you seed to sow. But when he gives it to you, you can't spend it. You've got to recognize it that it's the seed. That he miraculously... The reason why he's getting that seed to you is because he wants to get a blessing to you. And he can't go outside of his laws. From the earth, while the earth remains, seed, time, and harvest, winter and summer will not cease. God utilized his own law of seed time and harvest when he sowed his only begotten son. He called him seed. Yes. 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 And he reaped sons and daughters. Yes. Right. <laughs> praise the Lord. Okay, somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's uh, stand up, man. We want to close this thing down. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, this is your day. It's time to make Jesus your personal Lord and Savior. You need to have assurance that you're going to heaven. You need to know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And that the Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. And uh, uh, if you don't have that witness today, you know, we're going to pray. Let's everybody pray for those in this service today. There are those that do not know that they're saved. So we're going to say this prayer together, not to single them out and to embarrass them, right? But we're all going to say this prayer together. And if you're here and you not have that assurance that you're going to heaven, now's the time to be willing to turn from you know what's wrong and turn to Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please forgive me. I admit that I need you. I can't do life alone. I believe that Jesus died for me and rose from the dead. I can, I can be forgiven and have eternal life. I ask you to come into my heart by your Holy Spirit and make me brand new. Give me a new outlook. Give me that fresh faith. And I choose to follow you today, whatever the cost. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And uh, we're going to close now. If you said that prayer and you meant it and it was the first time that you said it, it's very important to me, th to, to God, that you, that you say you tell somebody. You've got to tell somebody because it seals, it seals the deal. You know, everyone that Jesus called, he called publicly. Matthew, the tax collector, got up from his seat publicly and followed Jesus in front of everyone. So if you said that prayer, you need to come up after the service and talk to me. And I got a free book to you, and I, we want to pray for you. Pastor Jesse and I want to pray for you. And uh, uh, anyone else, if you have any prayer needs at all, you can come up and someone will pray for you. <laughs> we'll pray for you. Let me bless you. Thank you, Father, for this great church. Thank you, Lord, for these beautiful people. Thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing in our lives and that you want to use us in our region. You chose us to be, to be here at this time, at this place, and to be used by you, and we're so grateful. We're so grateful that you've put us here to be used, and uh, we are find us faithful, Lord. Find us faithful, Father, to be your, your sentinels 
in our region and our, within our families. Bless your church, bless your people, encourage them. And I just pray right now an anointing of strength in their inner man, inner man would come down on the people of God. The strength that they need. They know the needs that they have in their life right now and what they need strength for God. And I pray for that supernatural strength of Samson to come upon them, Father, right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. We love you.